Let me open up. So yeah, this is me. My name is Max. I also go by the name Acer. <laughs> Acer. I <laughs> it's in case it doesn't work out with speaking. So. <laughs> yeah, so I also go by the name NG Wizard. And how many of you guys uh, look at Angular sources or have taken a look? Oh, cool. So many people. Uh, yeah, so and I have come here to tell you one important thing as well. I have an addiction, which is I'm addicted to reading sources, probably like some of you here, and in particular, Angular sources. So over time, I have come to a conclusion that it's not such a bad thing. After all, uh, you can greatly benefit from it. And today, I'm about to show it to you and about to prove it to you. We will be talking about today about Angular modules. And the thing about them is that sometimes they are really confusing, right? How many people agree that Angular modules are really confusing? Oh, not many really. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, when I first started to use them in non-trivial scenarios, I found a few things puzzling. For example, we all know that we have uh, encapsulation for components in templates, right? However, there is no encapsulation for dynamic components and providers. Okay, why is that? We will find out today. Then, there is no module hierarchy. Really, we have some modules that import others. However, there is no hierarchy between them. And also, most tutorials on the web can make you think that eager and lazy loaded modules are different types. But in reality, they are exactly the same. Again, we will see it today. Okay, so what we will learn is that we'll learn about the relationship between modules and injectors, and specifically, I will show you how modules are converted into injectors. And to do that, um, I'll tell you about my experience, reverse engineering Angular, and uh, the, I, I did that while working on the application and an extension mechanism for plugin-based applications. So again, I'll share with you some insights today uh, into building a platform with Angular. Okay, so let's get started then. The application I was working on is similar to a diagram designer. So we have a bunch of widgets in a toolbox and each widget has its own behavior and properties. To draw a diagram, you simply drop a widget on a canvas, okay? Where this application is interesting is that the default set of widgets in an application can be extended with widgets implemented by third-party developers, which basically makes this application an extensible platform, okay? This diagram illustrates the relationship between the platform and extension modules. So developers implement widgets, these extendable widgets, as Angular components, and then they package them in Angular modules, right? According to the Angular documentation, these modules are referred to as feature widget modules, right? but I refer to them simply as extension modules. So you can see here two extension modules with widgets that are used to extend the platform. One of the biggest challenges when working on this application was the implementation of an extension mechanism. So specifically, the question that I asked myself was how to load and render widgets implemented by third-party developers. Okay, now you may be thinking now that it's easy, but let me show you why it was really challenging. And to do that, I'll use Angular Material Library as an example. So you're all familiar with that, right? So how do we extend our applications with widgets provided by the library? We simply import an extension module with required widgets, right? And then we can use these widgets in our components template. Okay, there are two important things to note here. First is that we know exactly 
which widgets are provided by an extension module, right? In this case, what is the name of the widget that is provided by the module? It's the button, right? If it's math button module, correct. And second, since we import these modules explicitly, we know exactly which modules will be used as part of our application, right? So we import this module explicitly, this will be part of our application. However, in the application that I was working on, all this information was missing. Since developers can put as many widgets as they like in an extension module, uh, there is no information beforehand which widgets are provided by an extension module, right? This in contrast to what we saw. And second, each widget can also have a server-side implementation. So it has to be deployed to a server first, and then the list of widgets to be used in an application is generated on the server and then can be fetched with an API request. So there is no information about which extension modules to use until after the application has bootstrapped and the data is returned from the server, which effectively means that every single extension module would have to be loaded lazily, right? So these are the constraints that I faced, and this is why uh, extending the application with extension modules and widgets was really challenging. And what do you do when you face a difficult challenge? I don't know about you guys, but what I do, I take vacation. <laughs> uh, and that's exactly what I did, but this is not how I spent it. <laughs> I was actually debugging the router implementation. And why router, you may ask? <laughs> Because if you think about it, it solves similar problems, right? Uh, it doesn't know which routes are provided by routing module beforehand, yet it still needs to somehow retrieve them and add them to the global routes configuration. And second, sometimes, just uh, as I needed, uh, router lazy loads modules, right? So this was natural choice of debugging for me. Let me show you what I found. Um, I have removed all the relevant details and ended up with just four lines of code. This code shows what the router does to lazy load the module class, uh, routing module, and retrieve the widgets from it. Okay? There's really a lot of information in these four lines. Let's go step by step. So first, router lazy loads a module class. Then it compiles it and gets a module factory. Then this factory is used to create an instance of a module and an injector. And finally, it uses the injector to retrieve the routes. If you're looking at this code for the first time, you're probably confused now. So it doesn't make much sense to you. And don't worry, it didn't make much sense to me as well. It took me a lot of time to figure everything out here. And I will explain it to you now. And to understand this code, we have to first understand a few important concepts. Okay? So let's start with them, and we will start with the module factory. This is something that is widely used inside Angular. I first came across this concept when I was exploring the contents of the ng folder generated by Angular JIT compiler, right? You can see it for yourself. Just open the sources tab in the developer tools. There you will find this, uh, this folder with module and component factors inside. Basically, if you have used JIT, uh, sorry, ahead of time compilation, you have probably seen separate files, module factory, component factory. So this is exactly the same, just generated by the JIT compiler. Now, when I started to debug a little bit more, I found ng module compiler. This is a service inside Angular that takes a module class, which is JavaScript class, and generates a module factory. What is this factory? Well, basically, it's just a set of provider definitions, right? We define providers on a module class, so this factory contains the definitions for these providers. And also, it includes some relevant metadata. Let me give you an example. So 
Suppose we have some module here, and then we have two classes A and B, right, that are used as providers. So the B class depends on A because it injects a, an instance of it in a constructor. So when Angular ng module compiler takes this module class and generates the factory, the factory includes the definitions for these providers, but it also contains uh, dependencies, right? It specifies the metadata about these providers. And that's exactly what it is, just provider definitions. And if we get back to the router code, it's the second line that takes a module class and generates a module factory. Okay, the next line shows us how this factory is used to create an instance of a, of a module. Okay, we simply call the create method on the factory and then pass in a parent injector. What is interesting is that when Angular creates an instance of a module using factory, it also creates an instance of an injector that holds the providers defined on this module. And you can access this injector using the dot injector property. So in Angular, basically, a module instance is an injector. Okay, let's again see, let's recap what we've just learned. So we have a module class, right? We use decorator to, create, to create a module using JavaScript class. Then using either JIT or ahead of time compiler, we create a module factory. We've seen this factory with provider definitions. Then we call the create method on the factory. It's done in runtime. And we get an instance of an injector and an instance of a module, right? And as I mentioned, they are the same, okay? So looking at this diagram, you might be wondering now if every module in Angular gets its own factory, right? You have five modules, some modules import others modules. Do they all get factories, right? Let's test this. So here I have two module classes, A and B, with some providers. And then I have the app module that imports module A and module B. This is the module that will be compiled and instantiated when Angular bootstraps, like kind of the one app module that you usually have in your applications. So can you guess how many factories will be created? Any ideas? Three factories? We, have, we will have either three factories or one, right? <laughs> okay, so if you were silent but guessed one, you got it right. <laughs> so the three is a wrong answer. Well, actually, Angular creates factories only for the modules that are being compiled. It does not create modules for, uh, does not create factories for modules that are imported. Okay? But the interesting thing is that, of course, providers from the imported modules are included in this factory, right? So here we have PA and PB providers in the imported modules, and we also have definitions for these providers in a factory. Make sense? Cool. Incidentally, the factory also contains provider definitions for module classes to make them injectable. So you can inject an instance of one module class into the other. This is a lesser known feature I think really few people use. It. But it's there. Okay, so what we can learn from that is that it doesn't matter how many modules you import one into the other, right? In the end, you will still have only one module factory that will be used to create one instance of a module and an injector. This, is, this injector is usually referred to as root injector, right? Or app module injector. So now that we learned that, let's get back to our confusions. 
So I told you that there is no encapsulation for dynamic components and providers, right? Why is that? Well, because after the compilation, you don't have several modules, right? As we've just learned, you have only one instance of a module and an injector. And during the compilation, the, prov um, uh, yeah, the compiler cannot know where and how you will be using dynamic components and providers, right? It doesn't know your runtime uh, context. After the compilation, you don't have several modules. So basically, during the compilation, it cannot control encapsulation. So we do not have this feature for dynamic components and providers. Okay, also told you that there is no module hierarchy between imported modules, right? Again, you know why. We don't have several modules. How can we have hierarchy if we don't have multiple modules? We have only one single module. And, we sh and I showed you the process of compilation and instantiation of a module. And both eager and lazy loaded modules go through that process. It's exactly the same. The same ng module compiler class is used to compile eager and lazy loaded module. Okay, so we've done with theory. Let's get back to the process and the question that we started with, right? How do we lazy load and render widgets implemented by third party developers? Right? There was the question, so let's see the process that I came up with. And as you might expect, it will be quite similar to what the router does. Yeah. So we load a module class first. Okay. Then we compile it and get a module factory. Interestingly, this particular process can be optimized by first compiling a module class during build time using the head of time compilation. And then you can load this module factory directly to a browser. So no need to use JIT compilation, right? This will be faster. This is actually what we do uh, in the application I'm working on. So once you have a module factory, what can you do with it? You can create an instance of an injector, right? So we create a module instance and an injector. If you ever wondered what is lazy loading, it's exactly these four steps. Precisely, load a module class, compile it, get a module factory, and create an instance of an injector. Okay, once we have an injector, well, it's easy to use it to retrieve providers defined on that module, right? And Somehow, I need to retrieve widgets provided by these extension modules. So this is one more step to figure out. And again, we can use the router implementation as a source of truth. You all know that the router implements static methods for root and for child, right? You probably use them in your applications. And these methods take router definitions. So under the hood, the router simply registers them as providers using the specific token routes. There's no magic inside, doesn't do anything interesting. Just registers them as providers. And then when this routing module is compiled to an injector, it can use this token and retrieve the providers from the widget, no, sorry, from, from the module and injector. So I can use the same. Uh, here, I have one widget implemented as component A1 and an extension module A. So what I'm doing, just what the router does, right? I'm simply using the widgets token here and I'm registering one provider under the widgets token and as a value, I specify the widget definition with the widget name and the component that implements this widget. Again, once I load this module, compile it and instantiate it, I get an injector. Then I will do injector.get, right, to retrieve a provider from the injector and pass in widgets token. And voila, I get the list of all the widgets implemented and provided by the module. 
So I do not need to know beforehand which widgets are provided by an extension module, like the way we do that with a material library, right? So this is the process. Let's take a look at the source code. Or, I'm sorry, the code that I used to implement it. So we first load a module class, right? I'm using system.js here, but you can use any other uh, class loader, module loader. Actually, there is no alternative for system.js, so. <laughs> it's the only one you can use. <laughs> okay, now what do I do next? When I get this module class, I compile it and instantiate it and get a mo uh, an injector. I think this phrase, I compile it, instantiate it, and get an injector, this is something you will be dreaming about today because I've repeated it so many times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we get an injector. What do we do with that? You see here, I'm using this widgets token, right? And then I get a hold of all the widgets implemented by the module. So the question was how to load and render widgets, right? Here, I've shown you how to load them and get them. The only thing that's left is to render them. And since these widgets are implemented as Angular components and loaded dynamically, they need to be rendered as dynamic components, not static components found in templates. Right? The process of dynamic components rendering is quite broad. Right? I will not go into much details here, but if you're interested, I gave a workshop at ng-conf about two hours long when I went into details about DOM manipulations, all this stuff, dynamic components rendering, so you can learn everything from there. For now, just know that to render a dynamic component, you need to get a hold of its factory, something called component factory. And once you have this factory, you simply pass it into a view container that will instantiate the component and render it. And to get this factory, we use something called component factory resolver, okay? That is available on the module instance. And since we compile module and instantiate it ourselves, we already have access to this module instance. What I want you to do now is take a look, uh, take a second, look at all this code, and appreciate how much you can learn by reverse engineering. What is there is not documented anywhere. This is inside the router implementation. So if you get deep there, you can learn a lot, right? And maybe next time when you're feeling stuck <laughs> and don't have ideas, you will find that courage that is required to get into the sources, and maybe you will find some helpful ideas. And to help you with that, I started Angular In-Depth publication. How many of you know about Angular In-Depth? Oh, quite a few. Yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, I started it with the goal to explain how things work under the hood in Angular. So basically, uh, I'm not sure if I can say that, but this is the only publication that publishes articles with direct links to the sources. <laughs> When we explain something, we link to the sources. And I w yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, fan of sources. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I was really lucky to have other people join me in this quest. So today, Angular in Depth is the publication, is the place where you can find explanations for the most challenging topics about Angular and related technologies like RxJS. And just a month ago, we reached our first one million views, really. So if you want to become an expert in Angular and you're not one of our readers yet, <laughs> go and check it out. <laughs> it will be worth it. So what I've done is that I have put together a demo application that demonstrates how to lazy load this module, how to implement this extension mechanism I talked about today. And I put it on GitHub do check it out. Also, I have written a few articles. I've written an article on dynamic components rendering and dynamic 
and common confusions with modules. So again, check them out. You can follow me on Twitter using this handle. I regularly write stuff about in-depth uh, sources. So I'm in the works now and I think tomorrow or the day after tomorrow I will publish an article about IV engine internals. I've reversed engineered it uh, and I'm comparing it to the current implementation. Specifically change detection, compilation process. So today you can already find out what's in there even before like six months before it's released I think. <laughs> and what I want to say is that wise people say that truth lies within, right? And in case of Angular, it's within the Angular sources. So do not be afraid to read the sources and learn the truth. However, always remember that nothing stays the same, <laughs> especially with Ivy. <laughs> so thank you for your attention and good luck. <laughs>